Welcome to the Friday Forum. Our presentation, Dr. Brian Landsberg, Voting Rights Then and Now. As a reminder, today's presentation is being recorded and will be available for viewing later on on the Renaissance Society YouTube channel. If you have a question, you're welcome to answer, ask it. Just open the Q&A at the bottom of your screen, type your question, hit send. We'll be collecting the questions and as time allows, Dr. Landsberg will be answering them at the end of the presentation. So we're very excited to have Dr. Landsberg here. He is a professor emeritus at McGeorge School of Law, where he has taught constitutional law, anti-discrimination law, and other courses since 1986, and served in the Civil Rights Division, U.S. Department of Justice for 22 years. His book, Free at Last to Vote, The Alabama Origins of the Voting Rights Act, describes three Alabama cases he worked on as a young lawyer in 1964 and 1965. The book explains how Justice Department litigation developed the concepts that shaped the Voting Rights Act. Dr. Landsberg will be discussing the origins of the Voting Rights Act, the scaling back of its protections, and some current challenges to voting rights. So before we invite him on, let's take a quick poll. So there's three questions on this poll, and I'm gonna go ahead and read the questions and answers so that we can capture them in the recording. We'll be allowing two minutes to put your questions in. And as a reminder, if you only see two questions or one question, just use your uh, scroll bar on your computer or use um, the button on your iPhone to move on to a different question. So the first question is, who could vote in 1787? All white males, all citizens, only some white males, or I don't know. Question two, how did the constitutional amendments adopted after the Civil War affect the vote? This is a multiple choice question. The federal government was put in charge of voting. All citizens received a right to vote. The constitution referred for the first time to a right to vote. The government was forbidden to abridge the right to vote based on race, or I don't know. Looks like a lot of you are getting your votes in. The third question, what devices were used to suppress African-American voting before 1965? And this is another multiple choice vote. The grandfather clause, white primary, racial gerrymander, literacy tests, good character requirements, felon disenfranchisement, intimidation, or all of the above. So we've got about 20 seconds left on the poll. Numbers are rising. And I wanna invite uh, Dr. Landsberg to go ahead and turn his video and audio on. Okay. Thank you very much. And looks like we have um, almost 100 of 130 people who have voted. So maybe we'll give it a, a couple more seconds to get those answers. And once I end the poll, the question with the majority of the answer will turn in red. Okay, this is kind of like watching popcorn. I think we've got all the kernels wrapping it up. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end the polling and we will share the results. I'm very pleased to turn this over to you, Dr. Landsberg. Okay, I'm looking at the results right now. Uh, anyway, first, thank you for, for having me. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Um, and I'm glad to see that uh, people obviously are familiar with our early history and uh, that only some white males had the right to vote. Um, and I wanna talk about uh, the, the Civil War and, and afterwards a little bit later, uh, but uh, I think the answers there also 
reflect <clears throat> reflect that a lot of you are familiar uh, with what we're we're going to talk about, and I think probably most of us can remember when we first uh, voted in our first presidential election. Mine was in 1960 in the Kennedy Nixon election, and it was pretty easy for me to vote. Uh, but the ability to vote has varied tremendously uh, throughout our history, both uh, from one per time period to another and from one group to another. Our constitution didn't guarantee women the vote until 1920. Uh, residents of the District of Columbia still don't have the vote except for president, which they got in 1961. 18 year olds got the vote 10 years after that. But I think the longest running uh, voting issue, one that continues to, to, to today, is the deprivation of the right to vote based on race. And that's the focus of what I want to talk about. Uh, and I want to talk about uh, several different time periods. Uh, the first is from the drafting of the Constitution in 1787 until the Civil War. And the second is from the adoption of the 14th Amendment in 1868 to the political compromise that ended Reconstruction uh, only nine years later in 1877. The third is the period, the long period from 1877 to 1965. This was marked by widespread denials of the right of African-Americans to vote and, and uh, great efforts by African-Americans to reclaim that right. Uh, then I'll talk about the period from 1965 to 2013. This is the second, the period during the second reconstruction when the right to vote without regard to race was strongly recognized and was enforced. And then finally, the period from 2013 until the present, which has been marked by renewed efforts to suppress uh, the vote. So though we're now in a period of retrenchment, the overall trajectory of the vote has expanded access to the vote. The overall trajectory from 1877 to today, uh, seven, excuse me, 1787 to today has expanded access to the vote. Um, see, Lori, do I need to stop sharing the poll results now so people can see the slides? Yeah, you can go ahead and close that, uh, Dr. Landsberg, and just um, tell me when you would like me to move to the next slide. Okay, so uh, starting with the Constitution, um, the, the uh, you know, in 1787, uh, talk of any right to vote would have been foreign to uh, American ears. The Constitution doesn't actually mention any right to vote. The vote was a privilege. It was extended to a few white males with economic resources. Uh, and as a matter of fact, John Adams, one of, the, one of our founders said, well, if people without property were allowed to vote, that would open the door to women and children, which he regarded as quite dangerous indeed. And Catholics, Jews, Native Americans, free African Americans, and even some aliens might be able to vote in some places, but not in, in many others, uh, according to a, a, a very good book on the history of the right to vote by Harvard professor Alexander Kaysar. Um, but slavery, of course, began a racial caste system in the United States and most African Americans were slaves who could not vote as the Constitution's three-fifths clause recognized. And the United States was far from being a, a democracy. So this Article One, Section Two of the Constitution is the closest uh, to mentioning the, the vote. And you can see that the Constitution really left voter qualifications to the states. And in the years after 1787, the states did gradually 
open the vote to most white males. But as I said, voting was still viewed not as a right, but as a privilege extended to the dominant caste. So yeah, next slide. Uh, next, so then came the uh, Civil War. And, and in the aftermath of the Civil War, the country adopted constitutional amendments. They were meant to, the, the first one was the 13th Amendment meant to end slavery and its badges. And as you know, uh, ending slavery in the 13th Amendment didn't really change significantly the plight of the former slaves because the former Confederate states adopted what they called black codes. And they, those codes were designed to keep the former slaves in a condition of servitude. And that led to the adoption of the 14th Amendment, which granted citizenship to, Ameri to uh, African Americans and guaranteed due process and equal protection of the laws. The next slide. And it also placed in the constitution for the first time, the right to vote, which you can see here in uh, section two but that's an obscure provision of the constitution that was never actually implemented. And the former Confederate states persisted in denying the vote to the newly freed slaves. So the denial of the right to vote was a central feature of the racial caste system uh, does, that was designed to maintain the dominance of the former slave owning class over the former slaves. So although we now tend to think of citizenship as conferring a right to vote, the 14th Amendment's grant of citizenship did not lead to the vote. So then Congress began debating a new proposal to amend the Constitution. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, to the newly freed slaves. Uh, this was a controversial amendment. Uh, next slide. Uh, the, the uh, opponents said that African-Americans just were not qualified to vote. They argued that African-Americans were an inferior race and they objected to the federal government becoming involved in what had all, always been a matter that was left up to the states. Uh, the proponents of the 15th Amendment saw the 15th Amendment as essential to safeguarding the rights of African-Americans because without the vote, they really had no ability to protect themselves. So in 1870, section one of the 15th amendment did provide, as you see that the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color or the previous condition of servitude. And it authorized Congress to enforce it and Congress did pass legislation to do that. So this ushered in a brief period, uh, next slide, during reconstruction, when the right of African-Americans to vote was vigorously enforced by the federal government. Uh, there were, uh, as Jamel Bowie recently noted in the New York Times, it really heralded a transition from a white republic to a biracial democracy. The federal government became the custodian of freedom. Violent intimidation of black voters, the Ku, by, uh, black voters by the Ku Klux Klan led Congress to adopt laws to protect the right to vote without regard to race. And African-Americans were elected to the Senate, to the House of Representatives, to state legislatures, to local offices, and they were influential in advancing the interests of their constituents, including claims of equality. But voting by African Americans drew fierce opposition because it could undermine the racial caste system. As one Southerner said, the hearts of the Virginia people have never approved of the 15th Amendment, and true Virginians can never approve it. We do not believe that the colored man is the equal of the white man, and that is what the 15th Amendment means. So there was what was called a redemption movement that sought to redeem the South from rule by the Republican Party. 
This meant quashing the black vote. And the North grew weary of protecting African-Americans in the South from violent repression of the right to vote. And the compromise of 1877 led to withdrawal of troops from the South. And after that, court decisions undermined the ability of federal government to protect the right. And the end of reconstruction launched what I call the third period, which began with the adoption of a multitude of devices designed to de deny the right to vote to African-Americans. And as most of you noted in the poll, when I asked what devices were used to suppress African-American voting before 1965, and I listed several of them, uh, many of you said all of the above, which was right. The grandfather clause, the white primary, the racial gerrymander, the literacy test, the good character requirement, the felon disfran disenfranchisement, intimidation, so all of the above. And so supporters of African-American voting rights today trace their concern to this tawdry episode of our history that after only seven years, the rights guaranteed by the 15th Amendment began to unravel. By 1901, the unraveling was complete. For example, in 1900, over 100,000 African-Americans were registered to vote in Alabama. Restrictions in the Alabama Constitution of 1901 led over 96,000 of them to lose the right to vote. During this period, uh, as, uh, which stretched up to 1965, the Southern states did adopt this wretch menu of voter suppression methods. The grandfather clause enfranchised everybody who's all men that is, whose forebears were entitled to vote before the Civil War. Of course, African-Americans could not vote before the Civil War and at the same time imposed strict uh, restrictions such as the literacy tests on men whose ancestors were slaves and uh, the literacy test could then be applied up subjectively to deny the right to vote to African-Americans while granting the right to vote to whites. Disqualification of persons convicted of crimes was common, not just in the South actually, but in other states as well. Actually, California banned persons convicted of felonies from voting for, for life. Uh, and the South went further, however. For example, Alabama banned persons convicted of a crime of quote, moral turpitude unquote from voting, whatever that means. Well, it included such crimes as vagrancy. The Alabama Constitutional Convention had carefully selected crimes <laughs> that were thought to be African-American crimes as the basis for disenfranchisement. Southern states also adopted the white primary. Persons elected in the primary as a Democratic Party candidate were always elected in the general election. So the primary was the only election that mat mattered. The Democratic Party said only whites could be members and therefore uh, African-Americans could not vote in the primary election. And actually, if you see this ballot here, uh, this is act after the white primary was illegal, but the primary ballot in Alabama still had the words white supremacy written on it. So gradually litigation by African-Americans who wanted to exercise their right to vote eroded some of these devices. The Supreme Court knocked down the grandfather clause, the white primary, it struck down Alabama's criminal exclusion because as the court found, it was intended to suppress the black vote. But then success in striking down one restriction on voting generally led the adoption of another restriction. One famous example you see here arose in Tuskegee, Alabama. That's the home of Tuskegee University, the Tuskegee Veterans Hospital, and the Tuskegee Airmen, which were African-American institutions with highly educated staffs. So despite the many devices that were used to stop African-Americans from registering to vote, black registrants were becoming 
a powerful voting bloc in Tuskegee. So the Alabama legislature redrew the municipal boundaries to exclude 395 of the 400 black citizens before the redrawing the boundaries were this square. After it was, if you can follow this uh, cursor, uh, you can see it was a very irregular uh, figure, uh, which the court, uh, Justice Frankfurter said, uh, it changed the shape from a square to an uncouth 28 sided figure. Dr. Uh, C.G. Gomillion, who taught at Tuskegee, brought a suit in which the Supreme Court held this law was unconstitutional because as the court said, the inescapable human effect of this essay in geometry and geography is to despoil colored citizens and only colored citizens of their therefore of their theretofore enjoyed voting rights. So African-American uh, efforts to vote required expensive and time consuming case by case litigation. At this point uh, in 1957, President Eisenhower proposed that Congress passed the first civil rights legislation of the 20th century. And uh, I, this is when the second reconstruction began with Brown v. Board of Education in 54 and the Civil Rights Act of 57. It brought the United States Department of Justice into the battle for voting rights. I went to work for the Department's Civil Rights Division in January 1964 and was assigned to work on voting rights litigation in Alabama. One of those cases from Perry County gives a picture of the barriers to voting registration and the amazing efforts of African-Americans to overcome those barriers. My book writes about Perry County and it begins with this poem because of my admiration for how hard the African-Americans in Perry County worked to get themselves a right to vote. I love people who harness themselves an ox to a heavy cart who pull like water buffalo with massive patience, who straighten in the mud and the muck to move things forward, who do what has to be done again and again. And, and I guess the next slide. Um, so the next slide is the next poll. So can we put the poll up please? All right, so this poll has two questions. And so we're gonna go ahead and go with a minute for everybody to vote. So the first question is, do you know your name, your age in years, months, and days? And that's a yes or no question. And then the second question is, the duties and obligations of citizenship are to obey the law and to vote. Do you regard these duties and obligations as having priority over the duties and obligations you owe to any other secular organization when they are in conflict. So it looks like we are getting, uh, go, the numbers are going up fast. So Dr. Landsberg, what I'll be doing is um, when we hit 120-ish, we'll let it go a little bit more than a minute. Um, you can see the numbers climbing. Yes. Then I'll go ahead and end the poll and turn it over to you for the uh, anal analysis of the results. Okay. And let's go ahead and end the poll. Okay, so uh, it's interesting because uh, the, the first question is almost, uh, it's almost 50-50. Uh, more, of, more of us cannot figure out our age in years, months, and, and days, and um, th then can. And uh, two thirds of us uh, say that the, we regard the duties and obligations as the, <clears throat> to, to obey at law and to vote as having priority over the other one, over the duties and we, we owe it to any other secular organization when they're in conflict. And uh, one, a little over a third of us, or around a third of us, uh, uh, do not said the answer is no. So I'm going to explain 
uh, why uh, I've asked these questions as I go in talking further about Perry County, Alabama. So Perry County was a rural and forested county uh, located in the Alabama Black Belt, not far from Selma. In 1960, a majority of its citizens, of its residents were African-Americans, but 3,000 whites and only 250 blacks were registered to vote. And you can see this is an ad in the local newspaper uh, right after World War uh, II uh, that accurately predicted the future. Uh, the ad worried that the white primary being having been outlawed, that unless state election laws were tightened, we will eventually have Negro judges, Negro city and county commissioners, Negro legislators, and Negro law enforcement officers, just as we had in the dark days of Reconstruction. So the, reg the voter registrars in Perry County responded by allowing only one person at a time to, to apply to register by requiring that registrants supply a registered voter to, uh, to vouch for their character, uh, requiring them to sign an oath, rejecting them, their applications for minor errors. Uh, but local African-Americans organized voting drives um, and uh, the uh, Department of Justice brought, brought a suit that convinced the a federal judge that the registrars were guilty of racial discrimination. Nonetheless, the registrars kept inventing new ways to deny registration. Uh, so go to the next slide, please. So Ella D. Stewart, who had an 11th grade education and owned property in Perry County, tried repeatedly to register after the court ordered the registrars to stop discriminating. She made 17 efforts from 1962 to 1965. Several times she couldn't even get in the door of the registration office. Other times she was rejected without explanation. And if you look at question, uh, question four, says name the, some of the duties and obligations of citizenship, obey the laws and rules of the US and the state of Alabama and county. Uh, do you regard them as having priority over the duties and, and obligations you owe to any other secular or organizations when they are in conflict? Her answer is no. The correct answer is yes. So uh, one, one third of you uh, would not have gotten registered, I guess, except that if, if those one third were white, uh, the registrars would have told you to take another look and to change your answer. So you would have gotten registered. And we know that because we've seen the, the application forms. Um, so this was what we've often called the trick question. Um, uh, and so here, here are all the times when Ella D. Stewart tried to register to vote. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, in many places, voter registration was discouraged by economic intimidation. Here you see this is one of the first cases that the Department of Justice brought under the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1957. Uh, these, these sharecroppers were being evicted from their home because uh, they had registered to vote. And uh, this happened in uh, two counties in Tennessee and the Department of Justice brought suit uh, to, uh, to get them their homes back. Uh, next slide. Uh, another uh, uh, way that people were discouraged from registering to vote was through intimidation. And of course, uh, the intimidation would, would include killing civil rights workers who were working for working to for uh, uh, voter registration. So here are the three uh, young men who were killed in, the, in Philadelphia, Mississippi. Uh, next slide, please. Here are two of, their, uh, two of those who are responsible for their death, the sheriff and deputy of, of Neshoba County, uh, 
Alabama. Next slide. Um, so they were, uh, they were, of course, convicted of violating a federal civil rights law. They were not convicted of murder until much later. Uh, so let's, let's roll that uh, little movie now, because now we're going to go back a little bit to Perry County. There was a civil rights demonstration in Perry County. Go, let's go ahead. We are moving up the highway of freedom toward the city of equality. And we can't afford to stop now because Alabama has a date with destiny. Alabama's date with destiny was March 7th, 1965, Bloody Sunday. John Lewis was there leading the way. We are marching today to dramatize to the nation, dramatize to the world, that hundreds and thousands of Negro citizens of Alabama, but particularly here in the Blackbelt area, denied the right to vote. And we intend to march to Montgomery, with St. Grievous to Governor Joy C. Wallace. The marchers crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, only to be brutally stopped by state troopers who attacked with nightsticks and tear gas. Lewis and others went down. More than 80 people were injured. Martin Luther King, facing threats to his life, stayed away, but vowed the marchers would try again. I say to you this afternoon that I would rather die on the highways of Alabama than make a butchery of my conscience. Yes, sir. Television pictures of the violence shocked the nation and put pressure on President Johnson to act. It seems clear after this day that the pressures on the president are great. With his friends urging actions on him he doesn't want to take and his enemies waiting for him to slip. Mr. Johnson has responded to this pressure in a characteristic manner. Today, he spent over four hours meeting with civil rights groups. And during that time, Mr. Johnson did much of the talking. But the president's support of the marcher's cause was unequivocal. It is wrong to deny Americans the right to vote. It is wrong to deny any person full equality because of the color of his skin. In a nationally televised address eight days after Bloody Sunday, Johnson urged Congress to act, using the language of the civil rights movement itself. Their cause must be our cause too. Because it's not just Negroes, but really it's all of us who must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice and we shall overcome. A new march to... Thank you. <clears throat> so, uh, the, the genesis of, of the march uh, actually was in Perry County, Alabama, the county I was talking about, when uh, earlier a, uh, an African-American uh, voting rights uh, uh, worker named Jimmy Lee Jackson was killed by an Alabama state trooper. And uh, people said they needed, they needed to do something about this and uh, that led to the, to the march. There's a wonderful uh, video uh, called I, uh, Eyes on the Prize on YouTube that you can find on YouTube. And up, episode six tells this story very eloquently. So uh, I won't go get into it any further. So uh, it became the catalyst for the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And here you see President Johnson uh, who, who, end, who gave that speech ended with, ending with we shall overcome. Here he is signing the Voting Rights Act. It became law in August of 1965, and this inaugurated a period of expanded voting rights, act, voting rights that lasted <clears throat> for almost 50 years. Uh, Isabel Wilkerson, uh, the author, said that in 1965, the United States finally became a democracy. Uh, next slide, please. 
So the Voting Rights Act, what did it do? Uh, it, uh, the first thing it did was to ban racial discrimination in, in voting practices, uh, pretty much uh, what the 15th Amendment itself, excuse me, uh, also did. Uh, beyond that, the act uh, banned the use of tests or devices as a prerequisite to voting. First, first in specially covered jurisdictions, later throughout the country. The next slide, it created a uh, formula for deciding what jurisdictions would be specially covered. The special coverage applied to most of the Deep South. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, that shows uh, the coverage and the next slide uh, show is, is a map that shows the coverage. Uh, the Attorney General could send federal officials to register voters in those places and could send observers to monitor elections. Roughly a million new voters were registered under the Act, bringing African American registration in the South to a record 62%. And for the next 48 years, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act prevented covered jurisdictions from adopting new voting practices. So next slide, uh, that had the purpose or effect of discriminating based on race. In order to change polling places, to change district lines, to change registration laws or election day procedures, the jurisdiction would have to satisfy the Attorney General or the district court for the District of Columbia that the change would not discriminate. And over a thousand racially discriminatory changes were held illegal under section five. Many others were not adopted because section five was there. Uh, uh, one example, after a large number of African-Americans registered to vote in Mississippi, a county change from district elections of the Board of Supervisors to at-large elections. This stopped a majority of black districts from electing the candidate of its choice, of black citizens from electing the candidate of their choice. Racial block voting by the white county majority led to an all-white Board of Supervisors. So the combination of Section 5 and the ban on literacy tests and the new access to the voter registration process had dramatic effects at the polls. Next slide, please. So a year after the uh, Voting Rights Act became law in Selma, Alabama, the racist sheriff, Jim Clark, shown here, uh, ran against uh, the uh, police chief of Selma, Wilson Baker, who was a moderate, uh, for sheriff, and uh, the 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 uh, and Clark, because of of uh, the Voting Rights Act, lost his reelection reelection bid. The following next slide, please. The following year, I supervised federal election observers in Holmes County, Mississippi, where the first African American since Reconstruction was elected to the Mississippi legislature. This had an enormous effect on people's lives. Years later, I visited Jimmy Lee Jackson's and uh, Ella D. Stewart's Perry County. I went to the courthouse and found African-Americans occupying many of the offices that had been previously all white. I learned that the local law enforcement was now predominantly African-American and the black workers had jobs with the county. The roads in African-American parts of town were now paved where they had formerly been dirt. African-Americans were elected to Congress from Selma and from the covered states. So much of, the, uh, next slide please, much of this progress became precarious. On June 25th, 2013, when the Supreme Court struck down the special coverage formula of the Voting Rights Act as no longer constitutional. An opinion by Chief Justice Roberts in a case from Shelby County, Alabama said 
that although the court had upheld the formula several times in the past, the coverage formula of the act was out of date because it relied on statistics from 1964. And although Congress had recently extended the act and had found extensive continuing discrimination in the covered jurisdictions, it had failed to update the formula. And Robert said this violated something that he called the doctrine of equal sovereignty of the states. And unless Congress came up with a new formula that was satisfactory, the law could no longer treat some states differently than others. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg in her dissent accused Roberts of ignoring Congress's findings. She recited in detail the evidence of continuing need and concluded throwing out preclearance when it has worked and is continuing to work to stop discriminatory changes is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you are not getting wet. And so the Shelby County case began the current period, which I would call a phase of retrenchment. Our recent changes in voting procedures protecting electoral integrity or do they constitute voter suppression? Civil rights groups fear that recent measures could signal the end of the second reconstruction. They're wondering how far the gains of the prior 50 years will be eroded. And the race issue has become conflated with a political issue as African-Americans have migrated to or remained in the Democratic Party and white Southerners have migrated to the Republican Party. Intense party rivalry has led to voter suppression seemingly aimed at African-Americans. We see the partisan divide on this issue in Congress. The Democratic controlled House of Representatives has passed a bill named after voting rights hero, John Lewis, to restore the special provisions of the Voting Rights Act. The Republican controlled Senate refuses even to consider it. Do we still need the special provisions of the act? I believe we do. Voter ID laws, closing of polling places, voter purges, racial gerrymandering, limits on early voting. These are some of the modern voter suppression techniques that would have been suspect under section five of the Voting Rights Act. In fact, Texas reacted to Shelby County by saying that the voter ID law that had been blocked under section five would now be implemented. I wanna give you a few other examples of suppression after Shelby County. Do you know how your name appears on the voting rolls? Does it include your middle initial, a hyphen? Does it match your driver's license? The Brennan Center for Justice reports that in 2017, Georgia enacted an exact match law mandating that voters' names on registration records must perfectly match their names on approved forms of identification. In the lead up to the 2018 election, approximately 80% of the Georgia voters whose registrations were blocked by this law were people of color. A lawsuit did finally force the state to end that policy last year. Voter ID, it cures a problem that doesn't exist and it creates unnecessary barriers to voting. There just isn't any evidence that Ronald Tochterman ever tried to vote as Brian Landsberg. This kind of fraud is neither efficient nor safe. Yet states not only adopt voter ID, but manipulate what ID one can use. For example, Texas, permits voters to use a handgun license to vote, but not a student ID from a state university. More than 80% of the handgun licenses issued in Texas to Texans went to white Texans, while more than half of the students in the University of Texas system are racial or, or ethnic minorities. And you see here a, a slide about felon disenfranchisement. I recently participated in a case involving a, this form of voter suppression. 
Two years ago, 65% of Florida voters approved an amendment to the Florida Constitution restoring voting rights to felons who had served their sentences. It appeared as if a million or more voters might be added to the rolls. However, the Florida legislature promptly passed a law requiring the felons to pay all the fines, restitutions, fees, and court costs before registering. This erected a huge barrier to voting, both because the prospective voters could not easily find out how much money they owed, and more importantly, few people recently released from prison could afford to pay. And the law fell especially hard on African-Americans because of racial disparities in our criminal justice system. Uh, California had also, we also had banned felon voting as I mentioned earlier, uh, but, but by 2020, Florida was one of only a handful of states imposing such a, a lifetime ban. Uh, this federal district court judge said that the ban on voting was illegal. The uh, Court of Appeals reversed. Um, so this year, the COVID crisis presents challenges to voter access. The Supreme Court earlier this week decided a case that shows how race often lurks in the background. Some Alabama counties decided to allow curbside voting for voters with disabilities. The Alabama Secretary of State ordered them not to allow it. A federal district court found that the Americans with Disabilities Act required curbside voting option for voters with disabilities who wish to vote in person. The court ordered the Secretary of State to allow curbside voting, but the Supreme Court stayed that order by a five to three vote. Justice Sotomayor said in her dissent, Plaintiff Howard Porter Jr., a black man in his 70s with asthma and Parkinson's disease told the district court, so many of my ancestors even died to vote. And while I don't mind dying to vote, I think we're past that, we're past that time. So the backlash to conclude, the backlash against reconstruction led to rapid change from 1877 to 1901 when black disenfranchise, disenfranchisement became complete. The backlash against the second reconstruction has led to the adoption of a variety of voter suppression methods since 2013. This time, the voter suppression is less obviously race-based, though its effect is just to disproportionately disenfranchise African-Americans. Elections are the lifeblood of our democracy. They are legitimate only if citizens are broadly able to vote. The events of the past few years show the need for continued vigilance to protect the right to vote without regard to race. Thank you. Questions? Yes, thank you, Dr. Landsberg. Um, this is a question that appears, uh, the subject appears to be on a lot of people's minds right now. And uh, we have several questions that came in about the, uh, they came in right when you showed the map of the, uh, the Voting Rights Act. Um, one of them says, can the 15th Amendment be utilized to overturn the Supreme Court's revision of the Voting Rights Act in 2013? And could a United Democratic House and Senate demand that the statute return to its former status prior to 2013? Well, the, the Supreme Court said it was applying the 15th Amendment. Uh, so I, I don't think it can be used to over, in that way, but uh, the court seemed to leave open the, the doorway to Congress adopting a new law with a new formula for coverage. And uh, that is what the House of Representatives uh, has done. It, it did pass a law uh, with a new formula for coverage uh, based basically on uh, past uh, episodes of discrimination, more recent ones, and uh, uh, the Senate has not passed it. So uh, until, I, well, we'll see what happens within, with, when we get a new Congress in January. Okay. Um, another question we had um, on your map of um, 
regions that were affected by the 1965 Act. Um, California, several people noticed, was on the on the map, and uh, we have questions about uh, what practices were happening in California, um, and what uh, what effects did the Voting Rights Act have on those practices. So California was on the map because uh, when the act was amended uh, to ex it to expand its coverage to language minorities, uh, it required. It, it, it said that if, if the ballots that the, uh, were in, in English only, uh, that that, that, and, uh, that, and there was not much uh, voting participation in the presidential election, then there would be coverage. And the state of California as a whole was not covered, but Kern County was covered and Monterey County was covered uh, and maybe one other county, I think. So, uh, uh, though, because those were places that had large uh, Hispanic populations, uh, Latinx populations, uh, and um, people who had not been able to, to vote uh, due to language issues. Okay. Um, we have a similar question about um, Alaska. Same um, thing, same thing, uh, Native Americans in Alaska uh, uh, were, had had trouble voting. Uh, many of them, uh, their, their first language is a Native American language. Okay. Um, I have a detailed question here from uh, Ken Iratani. Hope I got that right. Um, he asks about... Um, what actions could be used to fix the current uh, voter suppression actions um, since the the, uh, the uh, Voting Rights Act has been uh, gutted? Um, could there be federal legislation? Uh, are there models in uh, uh, state uh, constitutional amendments that could be used as a model? Um, well, I think there are, yeah, sure. There are several ways that one could go. First of all, it is possible to bring a suit. There is one provision of the Voting Rights Act that uh, has survived, and that is Section 2, uh, which, as it now reads, forbids practices that, that result in racial discrimination <clears throat> in voting. Uh, and so uh, people can try bringing suit under Section 2. Um, California now has its own Voting Rights Act. <clears throat> so, uh, so there that uh, states can certainly adopt their own Voting Rights Act to, to protect them. Um, the third thing would be for Congress to, as I we've already discussed, for Congress to pass a new Voting Rights Act uh, with a new formula uh, of coverage. Okay. Um... We have another question about um, how Brown in 1954, uh, they're asking for some more details on how that affected uh, voting rights. Well, I didn't, <clears throat> I didn't put it in there for voting rights so much. It, it, what it did is to kick off what people refer to as a second reconstruction. And I think that it, uh, it, it um, started the, it, it, it brought the issue of race to the forefront. And uh, um, so it was only three years after that, that, that the 1957 act was passed. Uh -huh. Okay, and um, this may be uh, one of the most important questions uh, that's been asked, uh, at least in my opinion. Um, what organizations are working currently towards uh, strengthening voting rights? Um, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, which which is an organization that, uh, that I'm, I'm a member of, I'm on the board of, uh, has a very uh, robust uh, voting rights uh, project. It brings uh, voting rights cases. Um, and so it's one organization. The Brennan Center um, uh, uh, and I forget the full name of it, but the Brennan Center has a very good uh, voting rights uh, 
uh, project as well. Uh, in Georgia, uh, Stacy Abrams has, has started an organization. I don't remember the name of it, but uh, her organization is fighting for, vo for, vo for voting rights in Georgia. Um, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund is another organization uh, that uh, is involved with voting rights. Um, and the American Civil Liberties Union also. Okay, um, another questioner wants to know if you lived in Alabama while you were working for the DOJ in the 60s, and if you did, did you feel threatened by those who did not want African Americans to be franchised? I lived in uh, Washington, D.C., but I spent about half my time in Alabama. I was flying back and forth <coughs> um, uh, between Washington and Montgomery or, or, or Birmingham or Mobile, driving over to Selma uh, and to Marion and, and uh, lots of lots of different places. Um, I was carry, I was uh, driving a rental car. I was wearing a suit and tie. I had a haircut uh, and carrying a uh, Department of Justice ID. That generally was pretty good protection. Uh, I was not in the same danger as the civil rights workers, you know, in Selma, uh, after the after the march, uh, uh, Viola Liuzzo was killed. Reverend Reeb was killed. Uh, um, so uh, civil rights workers uh, were were very much in danger. Uh, I was threatened only once uh, directly, and uh, that was. I dealt with that uh, with the FBI, and uh, that was the end of that. Okay, we um, looks like we have time for just one more question. Um, in Florida, Bloomberg was donating money to pay fines for felons, so they could register. Um, how successful was that effort? And if you I could be brief, I think it's uh, I think it's ongoing. Uh, the problem is they have to find out uh, what fines they owe. The voter, the voting officials don't know. Uh, you have to go to the clerk of the of the court uh, where the person was convicted to, to find out that information. Uh, so I think that has been sort of uh, the the difficulty that people have had. Well, that was a wonderful presentation. It was certainly educational and very timely. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone that today's presentation has been recorded and will be available for viewing later on on the Renaissance Society YouTube channel. And also, we have another exciting forum next Friday. Dr. Jim Dragna will be talking to us about finishing for graduation success at Sac State. Make sure you register by Friday at 12 to attend the seminar. Thank you very much for attending.